Good morning. We are so thankful that you are with us to worship in spirit and truth, Holmes Road of Lansing, Michigan. We have um, quite a few announcements at the end of the sermon. If you would, before Brother Roger come and lead us in song service, let's have a word of prayer. Eternal God and Father, we are indeed thankful for your many kind and wonderful blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We're thankful, Father, that you have allowed us to allow our feet to hit the floor, our eyes to open, and we're able to see another day. We pray, Father, that as we come to worship you in spirit and truth, we pray that the word will be open to our hearts, that it will be settled on fertile ground. These we do ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church family. Glad you could join us this morning. Our first song in the worship service is Sing Hallelujah to the Lord. <clears throat> Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Lord, sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is living in his church. Jesus is living in his church. Jesus is living. Jesus is living. Jesus is living in his church. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. earth. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. He's coming back to claim his own. He's coming back to claim his own. Oh, he's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back to claim his own. So sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah to the Lord. Amen, church. Next song is He Lives. <clears throat> We serve a mighty God, don't we, church? We serve a mighty God. He blesses us every day, and he lives. I hope he's living in each one of your hearts. He's living in my heart this morning. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, 
Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blasts. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. <clears throat> rejoice, rejoice, O oh Christian. Lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujah to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Amen, church. Our scripture reading comes to us this morning, this morning, from Matthew chapter 5, verse 33 to through 37. And you may read along with me also. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply, yes. Uh, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. song before communion is why did my savior come to earth <clears throat> why did my savior come to earth and to the humble go why did he choose a lowly birth Be because he loved me so. He loved me so. He loved me so. Why he gave his precious. 
precious life for me, for me, because he loved me so. Why did he drink the bitter cup of sorrow, pain, and woe? Why on the cross be lifted up? Because he loved me so. He loved me so. He loved me so. He gave his precious life for me, for me, because he loved me so. Till Jesus comes, I'll sing his praise, and then to glory go, and reign with him through endless days, because he loved me so. He loved me so. He loved me so. He gave his precious life for me, for me, because he loved me so. Amen, church. Good morning, Holmes Road. Morning. Hope everybody out there is enjoying their Sunday morning and enjoying our services this morning. Thank you, Roger, for those songs. At this time, it's time to recognize the Lord's Supper. It's also called communion, which holds great significance to the believer and needs to be honored and conduct in a manner consistent with Jesus' teaching. It is so much more than just the consumption of bread and juice. It is a memorial to the remembrance of our Lord and Savior and the sacrifice he made on the cross for, for the forgiveness of our sin. By partaking in it, we are declaring our continued dependence on Christ and our desire to live within his fold until he returns for his church. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 26, the Apostle Paul wrote, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in, the blood of, in, in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, the first emblem of communion consists of the unleavened bread, representing the body of Jesus by partaking in the bread in communion, we acknowledge that Jesus is our Savior and our source of life. John quotes Jesus in 651 saying, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats the bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Let us pray for the bread. Father, we know that the bread signifies life. So when Jesus broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, he illustrated that his body, life, would be broken in order for, they, for, they may ha for them to have life. Likewise, the same opportunity applies to us. Lord, may each of us choose life 
It is in your son's name that I ask this prayer. Amen. The second emblem of communion is the cup of juice, or the cup. That represents the blood of Jesus. The symbol of the cup represents a measurement or a portion, and the juice, the blood, signifies suffering and death. Leviticus 17.11 indicates that blood is the life of the body, and that, it is, and that it is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Let us pray for the gift of the cup. Father, you gave Jesus a cup of suffering to drink, requiring him to be sacrificial lamb of atonement of our sins. He poured out his sinless blood through a torturous death that cleansed and made us whole. That blood, which washes, washed away the sins of the world, continues to cleanse us day after day. And for that, we are truly thankful. May you bless those who partake in the cup this morning. And it is in your son's name that I ask this prayer. Amen. Another part of our worship service is the opportunity to give. Separate and apart from communion, but convenient at this time. We have a number of ways to give here at Holmes Road, and we, we announce these each Sunday so that those out there can take advantage of whichever opportunity fits them. We have electronic giving. Go to our webpage and click on the blue Give button. You can text a contribution to 517-939-0079. You can contribute in person here at the church office on Tuesday and Thursday from 9 to noon. Or use the U.S. Postal Service and mail your contribution to 321 East Holmes Road, Lansing, Michigan, 48910. Let us give a prayer for the gift. God, our Father, you are the source of every good and perfect gift. We give thanks to you, for you are good, and your love endures forever. Please accept this offering, give, offering given today, given freely, given cheerfully, and given to honor the Lord our God. We pray that this gift is used to strengthen and further your work here at Holmes Road. And in everything, may thanks be given to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. The next song we're going to sing is before the uh, lesson from Stan is Jesus is Coming Soon. And this is a song that's fairly popular with our congregation, and, and we sing it uh, many times throughout the year. And I was just thinking as I picked this song, it's very appropriate for the times that we're living in. And, and I pray that as we sing it, you think about the words and, and, and be thankful to God for, for saving us. Uh, through his son. 
<clears throat> Troublesome times are here, filling men's hearts with fear. Freedom we all hold dear, now is at stake. Humming your heart to God, save from the chastening rod. Seek the way pilgrims trot, Christians awake. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. And all of the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the skies. Going where no one dies, heaven word bound love of so many cold losing their home of gold this is god's word is told evils abound when these signs come to pass nearing the end at last it will come very fast trumpets will sound my Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. And all of the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the skies. Going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Troubles will soon be o'er, happy forevermore. When we meet on that shore, free from all care. Rising up in the sky, telling this world goodbye. Homeward we then will fly in glory to share. My Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. And all of the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the skies. Going where no one dies, heavenward. Bound. Amen, church. Well, good morning, church. I hope everyone is doing well out there. And uh, uh, we just got some news that we would like to share with the congregation before we get into the sermon. But we have, uh, it has been told to us that. Pam Brock's son, Damien, ha is missing. And so we need to be in prayer uh, for that situation. And uh, we I can't even imagine what the feeling is like. Uh, I have three sons, and one of them went missing. I'd be out of my head, and I'm sure Pam's the same way. So we need to be in prayer. And so before we get into today's sermon, let's pray about that situation together. Father in heaven, we just uh, come before you this morning as we've heard the news that Damien is missing and, and uh, we just ask that he will be found safely and quickly. We ask that you intervene in this situation and that you will bring peace and the comfort that only you can. We ask that you'll be with those that are looking into the case that they will find uh, answers very quickly and that we will... Uh, we will have uh, Damien back with his family again, Father. We just lift this up in your name. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So uh, so we just wanted to mention that. I hope you'll continue to be in prayer. And we will make announcements and we will make posts on our church Facebook and, and things of that nature, emails. As soon as we get information, we will let you know. And so let's uh, continue to pray to that as we get updates. Hopefully very quickly that will be our world is in a lot of trouble uh, uh as we saw our capital storm this past week and all these things and and what's the answer well we we as christians we know the answer the answer is jesus christ the answer is love there's nothing loving about violence as we read love is patient love is kind you don't even have to go any further. i mean there's a whole lot more but love is kind uh, we as Christians need to be people of love, not of violence or support any of it. And so, and so today I just ask Christians stand up and show love. No matter what side you may be on, no matter what side you're on politically, it doesn't matter. What matters is we're on God's side. And we need to be people of love and peace and harmony and get along with people. 
That's what we're called to do. And so there's my, there's my just little addressing of that. Uh, we, this is not my sermon. I just felt the need to talk about that this morning. But as we have been introduced last week, we're studying about 12 ordinary men. We are looking at 12 ordinary men for the next few weeks. And we're looking at how we need to be. God selected 12 ordinary men. Jesus handpicked 12 uneducated, normal, uh, just, just the, the good common folks as his people to train and to teach and to carry on his work. And so if he selected these 12, what we're doing is we're looking at the lives of these 12 and finding what we can emulate. God selected these 12 for a reason. And I want to be someone that God chooses. And so we're looking at what we need to learn from these 12 men. Last week, if you missed it, go back. It's on YouTube and Facebook both, but go back and, and look at the introduction. But we looked at Andrew first, no particular reason. I have no rhyme or reason why I picked these in order. Uh, but, uh, but we looked at Andrew last week and we found out we can emulate his personality, which was to introduce people to Christ. That was last week. This week I want to look at Nathaniel, or some people call him Bartholomew. Nathaniel or Bartholomew, some people call him, it. He, he's the same person, just with two different names. And you may say Bartholomew, or some other people say Nate and Nathaniel, but it's the same person. The reason I wanted to look at him today is fairly simple. Uh, last week after we were done, my son Mark, who is now back at college, but Mark said, Dad, I, I'm kind of disappointed I, I'm not going to get to see the rest of yours. And I said, well, you can, you can hop online. But he's back in, in Arkansas, I'm worshiping with the churches that he loves now. But, but he said, I'm kind of disappointed because I've always wanted to learn about Bartholomew. So I said, well, I'll just do it this week since Mark, uh, that was the one he wanted to study. But So I wanted to look at Bartholomew and, uh, and, and just look at what we can learn from him. Or Nathaniel, but Bar the, why does he have two different names? Some of you may be asking, maybe the confusion. Why do some say Bartholomew? Why do some say Nathaniel if it's the same person? Well, very simply, Bartholomew is the family designation name. In, in fact, if you, if you translate the Greek word literally, literally Bartholomew means son of Tolmai. And so, you know, if, if I was walking around, uh, you know, back in Carlsbad, New Mexico, someone might look at me and say, hey, that's the son of Richard Craig. And so that would become my, my name, son of Richard. And that would be what I would be referred to as. And so that's what Bartholomew means. It means he's the son of that particular person. It's a family association name. It designates him as the son of. So that's what Bartholomew means, and so some people would say that. There goes Bartholomew, meaning there goes the son of Tolmai. But Nathaniel was probably his actual name, and the name that, that he goes by, and it was, his, it was translated, if you look at the literal name Nathaniel, it means the gift of God. And so mom probably, when he was, she was naming her son, said, this is such a treasure, this is such a gift from God, and so we'll call him Nathaniel. And so they, they, that explains the two different names. Uh, but it's the same person. It's the same apostle. Now, what do we know about this uh, particular apostle? Well, not a whole lot. Just like last week, just like we looked at with Andrew, we know very little. He's an obscure apostle, meaning there's not a lot of information known about him. There's not a lot of scripture dedicated to this particular person. But we want to look at what we do know about him and try to, and we're going to look at all the scriptural references this morning, one in particular, but, uh, but and we're not going to look at all of them, but I, we're going to look at one in particular. And I'll give you all of the scriptural references. There are basically five times that Nathaniel or Bartholomew is mentioned. Uh, by the way, from now on, I'm just going to say Nathaniel, but if you want to go by Bartholomew, that's fine. But Nathaniel is mentioned five times in scripture. Matthew chapter 10, verse 3, Mark 3, 18, Luke 6, 14, in John chapter 1, which is where we're going to spend most of our time today. If you have your Bible, if you want to turn to John 1, that's where we're going to spend most of our time. And then in Acts 1, 13. 
Now, of those five references that mention Nathaniel, four of the five are simply lists of names. Four of the five are simply lists of the names of apostles. And so it it lists the 12 names. And then um, the, uh, the fifth one is what we're going to look at today. Also, as I was speaking, uh, we got news. I want our prayers have been answered and Damien has been found. So I just want to let you know that uh, praise God that uh, our, our prayers were answered so quickly. Uh, prayers of righteous men avails much. And when the church prays, we have faith that God answers and he has answered and Damien has been found. So praise God for that. And uh, so now let's continue in the sermon. Uh, Four of the five references are just lists. And so we want to look at John 1, which gives us basically any information that we have of Nathaniel. If you have your Bibles there, read John 1. Let's begin at verse 43 together. It says, The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, like I said, in in every list, in every list that we have, and remember those four references above that I gave you in Matthew 10, Mark 3, Luke 6, and Acts 1, in every one of those lists of the disciples or the apostles, Nathaniel always follows Philip. Now, there's a reason probably for that. The reason those two always seem to be grouped is, is uh, it, it would suggest that those two were very close friends, that they were somehow tied together in a very special way. It's not a surprise that Philip, because of the fact that we know that, that Philip and Nathaniel are always tied together in those lists, it's not a surprise that here we see Philip is the one that actually brings Nathaniel great news. And what does Philip say? He, he goes to his friend, he goes to his buddy Nathaniel, and he says, guess what? We have found the Messiah. I mean, what incredible news. We have found the Messiah. He is here. We have found the Savior, the one that the scriptures have told us about. We, we, what Nathaniel is telling his friend, I mean, what Philip is telling his friend Nathaniel is we now know who Moses wrote about and the law wrote about and the prophets, everything they wrote about, all the, the thousands of years of telling about the Messiah, he's here. He is here. We know who the Messiah is. He's been identified. What exciting news. What If you grew up as a Jew like these men did, they're looking for the Messiah and he's been found after thousands of years. And then what is the response to this great news? What is the response that Nathaniel gives upon hearing this fabulous news? Well, he utters a notorious response that has never been forgotten. He he says something so so, uh, cynical that it has stuck with him for, for all these years. In fact, when people say, what do you know about Nathaniel? Or what do you know about Bartholomew? People say, well, he was the cynical one because of this statement. We're going to see here in just a few minutes where Jesus actually praises Nathaniel and gives him a lot of compliments. But for some reason, that's not what people remember. People don't remember all the good stuff that Jesus said about Nathaniel. They seem to just remember this statement that he makes that sounds so cynical. Upon hearing that the Messiah was actually here, upon hearing from his good friend, his trusted buddy, Philip, we found the Messiah. His response is here, In verse 46, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Wow. Now this this statement is what Bartholomew or what Nathaniel is always known for. And, And he gets a bad rap in terms of history in people's minds because of this statement. That statement was very skeptical. 
I mean, his buddy comes and says, we found him, we found the Messiah. We know this is a glorious thing. But Nathaniel's response is, what, Nazareth? Nothing good comes out of there. I mean, why be such a downer on Philip's news here, Nathaniel? Why be such a, why be such a Debbie downer? I mean, come on. Well, the fact of the matter is, when we look at Nazareth in terms of history, we, maybe we can cut a little bit of slack here for Nathaniel. Nazareth was not a significant place at all in terms of that time and in that time frame. Nazareth was a very isolated village with a population of less than 200 people during that time and era. I mean, it was a, no, it was a nothing village. It was extremely small. And look at this quote from a, from a, a, a what do you call it, a biblical archaeologist. But he says, even with such a small population, Nazareth was overpopulated since there was a scarcity of natural resources such as water and fertile soil. So his point is, even though there's 200 people, there was, that was too many for how pathetic this town was. Socially speaking, the, ter- the town of Nazareth had nothing going for it. The town was a place of extreme poverty. The people that lived there had nothing going for them. They were poor people. And in places that contained this level of poverty back then, the, the kind of villages that had this type of poverty that Nazareth had, it was just a natural place for sicknesses and diseases to develop. And so when people back then heard the term Nazareth, they thought pathetic, poor people, sickness, death and disease. That's the only thing that can come out of this place. That was just the historical reference that is in the people's minds at the time. And so when he hears that Jesus is the Messiah, when his buddy Philip says, look, guess who we found? The Messiah is Jesus of Nazareth. And his thought is, what? Nothing can come good out of Nazareth. Only sickness, poverty, patheticness, and disease comes out of there. And so... You know, that, that's a, that was Nathaniel's mindset. That was the vast majority of the people's mindset of the town back then. And, well, you say, well, that's all physical description. Well, spiritually, the description of Nazareth is not much better than the physical. First of all, Nazareth has no kind of history in terms of spirituality. Never, Na- N- Nazareth is never even mentioned in the Old Testament scriptures. It's never prophesied about. It's not known. There's no prophecy at all in the Old Testament linking the Messiah anywhere in Galilee, much less the town of Nazareth. And so, therefore, they weren't expecting anything. They were expecting the the Messiah to come from a prominent place. The king would come from a prominent place. And a, a place that is known for spiritual history known for some kind of a, a, a leadership position, a place of power. There's nothing special. There's no great spiritual teacher or prophet or mind or leader that, could ever, that had ever come from Nazareth. And so nothing special was ever expected to come from Nazareth because nothing ever had. Certainly, not the long-awaited, the highly anticipated, the, the joyous, loved Messiah. So the statement that comes from Nathaniel, although it sounds harsh, it is the mindset of most of the people at the time. Nathaniel utters it and he gets stuck with the skeptic uh, uh, ideas about him. But he is simply uttering what most of the people would have thought at the time. Nathaniel, let's, let's just move on to verse 43 through 49. Come and see, said Philip. He's after his skeptical response. Philip says, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. So as I said, Jesus, he says some amazing things about Nathaniel. 
Things that we don't remember. We all remember his skeptical response, his mean, uh, even prejudiced response there. But we tend to forget what Jesus saw. And Jesus said, here is a man who has no deceit. Nathaniel goes, and it, because Philip says, you've got to come see. And so Nathaniel goes to see. And I would imagine from his statement that he made, nothing good comes from Nazareth, I doubt if he's expecting a whole lot. He's probably going just because his, his friend Philip said, come and see. So he's all right, fine. But I doubt if he's expecting a whole lot when he, when he makes this little journey to see this Messiah that Philip thinks is the Messiah. Well, imagine the surprise as he's walking up to find this Messiah that his friend says is the Messiah. Imagine the surprise when he walks up and Jesus, he doesn't even, he doesn't even say anything. But Jesus is the first to speak and he looks right at him and he says, Here truly is an Israelite who has no deceit. Imagine the surprise where Jesus goes right into Nathaniel's heart and defines his heart and his character. Wow. Folks, they hadn't even met yet. It, it, and Philip hadn't even had the opportunity to have an introduction. He hadn't even said, hey, hey Jesus, meet my friend uh, Nathaniel. Nathaniel, here's Jesus, the Messiah. They hadn't even had the introduction as... Nathaniel is walking up. Jesus says, I know you. I know your heart. You are a man who has no deceit. I know your character. Folks, th this tells you some things about Jesus. Not only did Jesus know Nathaniel and Philip and everyone, he knows your heart. Right now, Jesus knows your heart, he knows your character. He is looking into you. You can't hide anything from Jesus Christ. He knows what you have done where no one else does. He knows what you've done when your wife's not around or when your husband's not around. He knows what you've done when you're by yourself on vacation somewhere. He knows all the little things. that All the little, little secrets that you may have from other people. He knows. He notices... He, Jesus notices even the smallest details of your character. He knows every hair on your head. He can see, Jesus can see inside you and he can cut through all the pretense. We can show up to church and fool people. We can put on a smile, you doing all I'm great and hey. And, but Jesus knows the depression in your heart. Jesus knows the anguish that you may be feeling, even though you can put a pretense up with other people. Jesus can cut right through it all. And so my question this morning is, he looked right at Bartholomew, he looked right at Nathaniel and said, this is a man with no deceit. That was his character. If you were to walk up to Jesus today, how would he describe you? What is the character, what is the heart of you that he would vocalize? Imagine yourself like Bartholomew, going to see, going to see the Messiah, going to see the King. And before you can even walk up, he looks dead in your heart and starts to describe you. What does he say? That is my question for you this morning. Well, Jesus, I want to point out here. Jesus pointed out, it out the good in Nathaniel. And we know just from Nathaniel's statement that there, he wasn't always, I mean, he made some mistakes. Jesus could have said some different things here. Jesus could have said, hey man, sorry to burst your prejudice bubble, pally, but here I am. I'm God in the flesh. Bet you feel pretty silly now having said that stupid statement about how nothing could good come from Nazareth, huh? Jesus could have said things like that. He could have called out the prejudiced statement that people had against Nazareth at the time. He could have. He could have rubbed some little dirt, rubbed his nose in the dirt a little bit, got a little revenge there. 
He didn't do any of that. Jesus had already forgiven that statement. He already forgave Nathaniel for that silly, ridiculous statement and accepted Nathaniel even before Nathaniel had said a single word. Jesus had already put the past behind and he said, You've met me. I know your heart. And that's what I'm going to focus on. And Nathaniel hasn't even said hello yet. He saw the good in Nathaniel. And he focused on the positive aspects of this person. Folks, I want to challenge us to do the same to others. I want to challenge us as Christians who are out there to have the eyes of Christ. And all of us have flaws. All of us have flaws. I have flaws, you have flaws, our elders have flaws. Everybody has flaws. But Jesus didn't even mention the flaw, did he? He focused on the positive. He looked right at at Nathaniel and said, You are a man who has no deceit. You're an honest person. You're a person who is full of integrity. Now, we have the choice. When we look at someone and we see flaws, we can focus on that. Well, that guy's such a jerk. He don't know what he is. Or we can focus on the positive like Jesus did and build people up and encourage them and train them to be something. That's what Jesus did. You see, he saw the positive in Nathaniel. And the fact that Jesus said, this is a man with no deceit, at that point in time, that means Nathaniel was very different from all the other Jews that seemed to exist at the time. You see, uh, he, what, what Jesus is doing here, when he made that statement, this is a man with no deceit, he's saying this is a true Jew that has nothing false about him. No deceit at all that is in his heart. This is an extremely rare character trait for the time that they're living in. The time where the Pharisees ruled the spiritual land. In the Jewish Pharisaical time with which they lived, to, have, to find a Jew with no deceit, that's pretty rare. Because the, as we find out from Jesus as throughout the New Testament, the spiritual time that existed back then amongst that Pharisaical time, Jews offered sacrifices of repentance, but they were unwilling to change their lives. They were full of deceit. They were worried about what they looked on the outside of the cup instead of inside of the cup. The Jews at that time, the Pharisees, they went to the temple to worship, but it was just habit. It was heartless, roped, and shallow. Jesus called them out on this many times. In public, they appeared godly. And in private, they are about as ungodly as could be. And again, Jesus constantly called them out for this. And amongst this kind of spiritual time frame, amongst this, amongst all the spiritual leaders, uh, this, this man rose above all that. The, the people at the time, those Pharisees, they were circumcised in the physical. But their hearts... They were far away from God. This is that time. And Nathaniel had a heart that was above it. In this environment, Jesus looks at Nathaniel and says, This is a man who doesn't have any deceit in him. This is a man of integrity. Nathaniel was a man who truly believed and worshipped and lived for God. There was nothing false about this man at all. Even his statement that he's infamously known for. When he says, can nothing good... At least he's being honest about what he thinks. And so Jesus says, this is a man who doesn't beat around the bush. He doesn't say what you want to hear. There's no deceit about him. He doesn't say one thing and then do something else. This is a man who lets you know where where he stands. This is a man full of integrity. The scripture that that Jerry read for us this morning out of Matthew when he says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. You don't have to swear oaths. You don't have to do all this stuff because Christians people just say yes or no and they, they, that's what they do. That scripture seems to embody Nathaniel's character. He had no deceit. When he said yes, you knew he meant yes. 
When he said no, you knew he meant no. There was nothing false about this man. Look at verses 48. Verse 48 says, how do you know me? Nathaniel asked. How, how, do, how could you know me? I didn't even say anything. Jesus answers, I saw you while you were sitting under the fig tree before Philip called you. Now, you can imagine Nathaniel's confusion here. I mean, he, he's just walking up. He's walking up to find out if this is the Messiah. He's, and he gets this definition of his heart fed to him. How, you can imagine Nathaniel saying, how does this stranger know me in such a way as to make a statement like this? And so what does he do? He asks. He comes right out and asks. He says, Jesus, I, uh, and Jesus says, this is what I know about you because I saw you sitting under a fig tree. A little while ago. Now, what kind of answer to the question is that? When, when Nathaniel says, how do you know this about me? Jesus says, well, I saw you sitting under a fig tree. So therefore, I saw your heart. What? That doesn't make sense either. How does that answer the question? And Nathaniel says, how do you know that I'm a man of integrity? How do you know that that is my character? How do you know that? And she said, I saw you sitting under a fig tree. How does that answer the question? It doesn't. How can you see sitting, someone sitting under a fig tree and know his heart, his character, his integrity? The answer is you don't. I can't see anybody sitting under a tree and know their heart and their integrity. But Jesus did. Therefore, what was he saying? I'm the Messiah. The only way that, that when Jesus answered Nathaniel's question, how, how could you know me? Jesus is saying, I'm the Messiah. I have the ability to see who you are. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God that you have come to find. The thing that when you said nothing could come out, I don't really believe that is the Messiah, nothing could come out of Nazareth. Jesus just proved him that he was. Nathaniel. Look at verse 49. Nathaniel declares, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Nathaniel, being that straightforward man that he is, the man who has no deceit, Nathaniel, the one who, who was prejudiced, who prejudged someone based on where they come from, Nathaniel, the honest one, he knew he found the Son of God right then and there. And I, before we leave this verse about the fig tree, I want to talk a little bit about it. The fig tree had a little bit more symbolism than what we know about, I think, in today's culture. People back then, they did not just sit under fig trees for the shade. I mean, that, that's not why you find someone sitting under a fig tree. In fact, fig trees don't even provide a lot of shade. They're not real leafy. They're not real branchy. There are a lot of other trees more suitable for that. So why would people sit under a fig tree? Well, according to many experts and social experts at the time, in that time of Jesus, the fig tree was a symbol to the Jews of fruitfulness and spiritual fullness. As a matter of fact, people in that time would often sit under a fig tree as a place to go for reflection, study, and meditation. If someone was, at that time, if a Jew was sitting under a fig tree, you didn't bother him. Everyone knew this person under a fig tree because he's contemplating, he's spiritually reflecting, he's maybe in prayer. And so you left him alone. And, and the, the fig tree was a place where people would pray and express their hearts to God. It, and I wrote this from, from Mounts. Mounts writes, It was the place where a Jew expressed their joys and sorrows. Their victories and their failures, their confidence and their doubts. To be under a fig tree was the Jewish way to express their relationship with God. Under the fig tree is where you laid out all of your faults and your sins and your doubts and your questions. It's where you bared your soul to God. And so Nathaniel. Nathaniel's sitting under the fig tree. Nathaniel wanted God to see his heart. That's what we get when we, when we read that Jesus saw him under the fig tree. We kind of just go past that because we don't understand the, the symbolism that's going on there. But, but when Jesus said, you went to that place to lay your soul bare to God, he says, but I saw it. You see the symbolism? 
Nathaniel, you went to the fig tree to get close to God and to bear your soul to him. And guess what? I'm the one that saw it. I know all about your character. I saw your heart. It worked. God did see your heart. Nathaniel wanted a relationship with God. And Jesus says, you got it, pal. You have a relationship with me. I know your character. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. And that's what Jesus says. He says, I saw you knocking. I saw you asking God to, to know you, to have a relationship with you. Well, you've asked. You've sought. You're knocked at the door. Here I am. And so that is the lesson of Nathaniel. And this morning I want to ask about you. Are you like Nathaniel, a person with no deceit? What a great compliment Jesus gave to Nathaniel. Can he say that about you? Are you a person striving for integrity? You're not two faced. You don't say one thing and do another. This is the compliment that Jesus gave. Gave Nathaniel. Are you a person seeking a relationship and oneness with God? We can look at Nathaniel and see his life and how it, when he simply asked, he received it. So this morning, I ask you, if you are seeking a relationship with God, you need to simply ask. Come to him. Come to him. Let him into your life. If you do not have Christ in your life today, you need to get with us. You need to call now. Call an an elder. Call me. We'll sit and study with you and show you what you need to do to get into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You need to be a believer in the word and repent of your sinful, selfish life. Be willing to put away that old life and take on a new life. Of service to Christ. You need to confess. That he is your Lord. And be baptized. Into the body of Christ. For the forgiveness of your sins. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And live a life of faith. And you can have a relationship. With Jesus Christ. Twelve ordinary men. Nothing special about these men. But God called them. And we can learn from them. And that is the lesson for you this morning. The elders are here. They have their cell phones. And they will be happy to uh, pray for you if you have any needs. You can post them on Facebook or you can text them individually. You can call them. Whatever your need is, do it now as we sing this song. Thank you, Brother Stan, for that message. A song of invitation is Restore My Soul. Restore my spirit, Lord, I need restored. My heart is weary, please help me, dear Lord. I stand in need of more strength from your word. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Revive the fire, Lord, deep in my soul. Stir my desire to work in your fold. Light in my heart, dear Lord, your zeal grow cold. He knew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Renew my courage, Lord, it needs restored. My cup is empty, refill it, dear Lord. Replace all doubts and fear with faith so bold. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Amen, church. Again, good morning. I have a a lot of uh, announcements this morning. First of all, 
For those that may be interested in going to the Family Hour on Thursday, January the 14th, for our dear sister Sherry Davies, Davy, I'll be driving the church van. I'll be leaving here at 3.30. Uh, if you're interested, contact the church or you can give me a call. The elders have uh, issued a letter out to for the congregation to be informed. It's a lengthy letter, so I'll summarize it. It indicates that we will conclude for the month of January, we will have no um, open services or we will not reopen the congregation. What we will do is as of the first Sunday in February, we should be able to have a little more information as to when we will be able to resume services. One of the things that this congregation has been experiencing um, over the weeks is that they have lost relatives, uh, friends, kinfolks, and what have you. Teresa Jones, the niece of Dorothy Osborne, Mary Bates, and Ruth Atkins passed away in Memphis, Tennessee. Please uh, provide prayer for the family. Sister Sally Harris has a brother-in-law that passed away. The Campbells have been experiencing with COVID ask that you be praying for that family. Denise Nam requests prayer for her friend, Frank Badgerly. Uh, the family of Wellington Burrell, who passed away on Christmas Day. And we ask that you continue to be praying for that family. Ronnie Thompson, Continue to pray for him in your prayers. Continue to be praying for Robin Lewis. Here's a thank you card. to the family of Holmes Road Church of Christ. Sometimes just to say thank you is just not enough. During the time I was ill, I want to thank you for your calls, your cards, and your prayers. If that wasn't enough, the wonderful holiday basket, I am indeed glad to be a part of this family. Love, Marvin Miller. From Larry and Pam Lyons, to our sisters in Christ, for the lovely and much appreciated Christmas gifts bag. A lot of time and work to process. Thank you so much for your kindness and love. What a wonderful church family we have. May God bless and Christian love all of you. From Earl and Sharon Nicholson, to our sisters of Holmes Road Church of Christ. Thank you for thinking of us this holiday season. From Carol Pace,
to our sisters in Christ and our church members, thank you so much for the beautiful Christmas basket. I appreciate it with all my heart. It made me feel so very loved, special, and happy to be a part of such a loving congregational family of God. Brother J.D. Forrest requests prayer for Elmer and Ruth Woodward. Our sister Janna Craig, aunt Charlene McDonald. Her ALS is progressing and her breathing is becoming more laborious. I want to be praying for her. For Robbie and Robert Stewart. They have COVID-19. They both have received treatment and are receiving uh, recovering. Please keep them in your prayer for full recovery. For our sister Celeste, her daughter Araja, she has COVID-19. Please, please pray for her that she may have a full recovery also. Dear Holmes Road Church of Christ, I would like to thank you for your loving kindness, prayers, phone calls, cards, and concern during my recent hospitalization. I returned home. All were greatly appreciated. God bless you all. Love in him, Sister Becky Bennett. The funeral arrangement for our Sister Sherry Davy will be Friday at 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we are indeed thankful for the love that you have shown toward each and every one of us. Father, this enemy that we are confronted with, COVID-19, has been not exempting any members of the body of Christ. And we pray, Father, that you will continue to protect and guide and direct them. Father, we pray that you will watch over and comfort the Davy family as they prepare for funeral arrangement for our dear sister. We pray, Father, that the decision that has been made that the congregation for the month of January will be suspended and that we will look forward to in February to make other decisions. We thank you. We pray that you continue to watch over us and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen.